Two, the death of man. In Genesis 2.17, God declared to Adam that on the day that Adam disobeyed God and ate of the forbidden fruit, he would surely die, or dying, thou shalt die. In brief, the process of death would begin to work in Adam. Let us now, at some length, analyse what this sentence of death meant and means. An insight into its meaning appears in Ephesians 3.15. Earlier, in Ephesians 2.18, God the Father is spoken of as the Father to whom believers have access by adoption in Christ. In chapter 3, verse 14, God the Father is spoken of as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, end quote, and then follows in verse 15 the statement concerning God that he is the one, quote, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, end quote. Some commentators would limit this whole family to all races of the children of God who through Jesus Christ, not by nature but through the new birth, are created in Jesus Christ, 2.10, and are now children of God, end quote. This seems unduly to restrict the meaning of the text. There is another meaning which seems to fit more closely with the temper of the passage, namely that entrance into the faith is entrance into the true meaning of life, family, and all things else. Westcott interpreted Ephesians 3.15 thus, The absolute title expresses an important truth. In pre-Christian times, God had revealed himself as father to one race, now it is made known that all races of men are bound to him in Christ by a like connection, and far more than this. Who is the father of men is also the source of fellowship and unity in all the orders of finite being. The social connections of earth and heaven derive their strength from him and represent under limited conditions the power of his fatherhood. Every quote-unquote family Every society which is held together by the tie of a common head and author of its being derives that which gives it a right to the title from the one Father. From him comes the spirit by which the members have fellowship one with another and are all brought together into a supreme unity. End quote. Just as God is the creator of all reality, so too God is the primary reality. Apart from him, nothing can exist. All justice, order, structure, design and righteousness come from him. Evil is man's rebellion against God and God's order. All things, all families, all structures are named or take their names from God. As we have seen, names in the Bible are definitions. When St. Paul says of God that it is he, quote, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, end quote, he means thereby that all things receive their structure, design, meaning and purpose from God and have none apart from him. Every aspect of life is named by God, is defined and can only be lived and understood in terms of him. Thus, any attempt by man in rebellion against God to maintain civil order, family life, community or anything else apart from God is doomed. The more men and cultures abandon God and his law word, the more they forsake life in all its forms. There is thus no community in hell, no family life, no unity, no relationship, nothing but total isolation in hell. The imagery of hell in scripture emphasizes this fact of total isolation, weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth, the self-torment of the isolated and totally self-absorbed. There is also the imagery of fire, the gnawing worm, the burning of conscience and sterile remorse, total dedication to self-exaltation with total self-pity. Separation from God is thus hell and the death of man. As we have seen, the pagan and humanistic view of power is power as the ability to control and change others. Unlike God, men cannot regenerate, he cannot make man anew from within, and as a result he strives to coerce man into the desired patterns. The result is disillusionment. 
whether the philosophe of the Enlightenment or the revolutionists and liberals of the 19th and 20th centuries, humanistic reformers have found men resistant to their proposed changes. Coercion only breeds sullen resistance. Hence, very early, a central aspect of the humanistic faith came to be a hatred for man as he is. Friedrich Nietzsche carried this position to its logical conclusion. Beginning with the love of man, he turned on humanity for rejecting his reforms and answers. The need is not for man, but for superman, and superman can only be born if man is destroyed. Humanity must be smashed and remoulded in order to create a super race. The world of the future is to be beyond good and evil, beyond morality, and also beyond man. Since Nietzsche's superman is at war with God and with man alike, he is, Nietzsche conceded, perhaps most clearly to be identified as the devil. Quote, Zarathustra, the first psychologist of the good man, is consequently the friend of the evil man. When a degenerate man arises to the highest rank, he must do so only at the cost of the reverse type, at the cost of the strong man who is certain of life. When the herd animal shines with the bright rays of the purest virtue, the exceptional man must be degraded to the rank of the evil. When falsehood insists at all costs on claiming the word truth as its world outlook, the really truthful man must be sought out among those of worse repute. Zarathustra is quite equivocal here. He says that it was precisely the knowledge of the good, of the best, that caused his horror of men. And it was out of this feeling of repulsion that he grew the wings with which to soar into distant futures. He does not conceal the fact that this type of man, a relatively superhuman type, is superhuman particularly as compared with the good man, and that the good and the just would call his superman the devil. End quote. Here, as in other passages, the truth comes out. There is no superman in Nietzsche, no new life beyond good and evil. Nietzsche's superman is also a negation and a destroyer, and he rightly describes this type of man as the devil. Nietzsche cannot affirm life in the end, nor community, nor love, nor anything except hatred, destruction, and self-isolation. His thinking, and that of all his fellow atheists, made Orwell's 1984 a logical conclusion. Orwell saw the end result of the modern dream of power. Quote, power is in inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating? It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery and torment. A world of trampling and being trampled upon. A world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. Progress in our world will be progress toward more pain. The old civilizations claimed that they were founded on love and justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. End quote. This is the necessary goal of the pagan dream of power. Because man is created in God's image, he can never be successfully made over into man's planned image. The result is frustration for power-motivated man, and in his anger he employs all his power all the more nakedly in order to use man as his total creature, and to do so destructively. In the process of arriving at this goal, humanistic man must eliminate biblical moral considerations from the human scene. Biblical morality affirms that all absolute power belongs to God and that man's power is a gift and a blessing. The gift is withdrawn as man's moral obedience to God declines. In Deuteronomy 28, we have an emphatic statement on the correlation of morality with blessings and power. Gifts are withdrawn where disobedience prevails and power is transferred to the faithful and obedient. 
As against this, the humanist must insist that moral judgments cannot be used because they intrude a supposedly private and discriminatory judgment. Dr. Basil Yanovsky, in his record of work in a New York venereal disease clinic, reports on a complaint filed against him. In treating a 17-year-old girl, he had concluded his checkup with these words. And meanwhile, behave. This was grounds for a complaint against him of violating the patient's privacy. In a world of crime, corruption and disease, Dr. Yanovsky noted the intolerable fact was a moral world. The sick world of disease and crime cannot permit moral judgment because it then stands condemned and powerless. If the validity of moral judgment in terms of God's word is recognized, then the entire fabric of the modern world can only be self-condemned. It stands, of course, condemned in God's sight, but its collapse would have come quickly if it stood condemned in its own eyes. Some of the death of God thinkers have seen their philosophy as requiring as its consequence the death of man. To abandon God and his law is for man on any terms to abandon life as well. According to Deuteronomy 28, 2 and 15, irresistible blessings follow obedience to God's law and irresistible curses follow disobedience. The curse that began with the fall pursues man into death and hell. The blessing of God through Christ means the beginning of a new creation and the triumph of man in and through him.